Hello, everyone. Hi. A responsive crowd, that's good. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. My name is Shahenda Helmi, and I'm the Programs Director at the Penn Faulkner Foundation. I'm so pleased to welcome you all to our second literary conversation of the season, co-hosted tonight by the Institute for Middle East Studies here at the George Washington University. I'd firstly like to thank the Institute for co-sponsoring this event here with us tonight and for making it possible. I'd especially like to thank their outreach coordinator, Allison Kaisia, who has, I think, been in correspondence with me about this since early July <laughs> to bring this night together. So thank you, Allison, and that entire team. The Penn Faulkner Foundation is a literary arts nonprofit that's based here in Washington, D.C., but has a wide and national reach. While we're most known for our award for fiction, which is one of the top three literary prizes in the United States, we are proud to say that we have expanded to become so much more than that in the years since our inception. Our public programming events, including our literary conversations, bring authors from all over the country to DC to engage in a uh, conversation not only about their work, but also about the most pressing issues facing our world today. Our Writers in Schools program brings free books and author visits into DC public and public charter schools. And we've found that these visits with real living authors leave students with the knowledge that they do have a story to tell and that there are people out there who are eager to hear it. Our work would not be possible without the generosity of our grantors and our donors. And speaking of donors, in case you don't know, today is Giving Tuesday, an international day of charitable giving that encourages people to give to the, don to the organizations that mean the most to them. I'm sure that you all have many causes to be passionate about, but I hope that you'll make the Penn Faulkner Foundation one of them by donating tonight. If you would like to donate to our organization, please see our book selling table outside where we've got volunteers equipped with credit card readers ready to take donations in any amount because no donation is too small, and I truly mean that. Okay, enough with the shameless plug. Um, our conversation tonight feels especially important nowadays. No one can deny that we live in a country and a world where immigrant voices seem to be silenced. Our three featured authors tonight have done anything but shy away from their Arab American identity. In fact, as you'll see tonight, it is quite central to their work as it is central to their lives. Leading the conversation tonight is Hannah Alam, a national reporter for BuzzFeed News, whose reporting on Muslim Americans in the Trump era has earned her multiple national reporting prizes. She has also spent many years uh, with the McClatchy News Bureau uh, and has served and covered the Iraq War in Baghdad and the Arab Spring Uprising in Cairo, Egypt. Many events that have affected not just the Arab world, but the world as a whole. We are so honored to have Hannah here and all three of our incredible authors. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Hannah Alam, Susan Darraj, Osama Al Omar, and Layla Halabi. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you for to Penn Faulkner's Foundation for you know sponsoring this literary conversation series, or as I like to think of it, a night with all the writers I wished I'd had access to growing up as a, an Egyptian American kid in Oklahoma. Um, so it's an honor to share the stage tonight with three accomplished writers whose work addresses timeless themes like identity and exile as well as some of the most pressing issues of our day, human rights, immigration, foreign policy. I am delighted to introduce, starting from hero Sam al-Omar. He was born in Damascus, Syria, now lives in Pittsburgh. He's the author of three acclaimed collections of short stories and a volume of poetry in Arabic, and he performs as a musician. I forgot to ask, what do you play? I love playing the Beatles. Playing the Beatles. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I was guitar player and uh, guitar. singer. All right. Uh, stick around for the after party. No, just joking. <laughs> uh, his short stories have been published in all your favorite publications, Plowshares, Triquarterly, The Southern Review, NewYorker.com, and many others. Uh, New Directions published Full Blood Arabian, a pamphlet-sized collection in 2014, and the story collection The Teeth of the Comb in 2017. Uh, we have Susan Wadi Daraj, her short story collection from 2015, A Curious Land, Stories from Home, was named the winner of the AWP Grace Haley Prize for short fiction. It also won the 2016 Arab American Book Award, a 2016 American Book Award, 
and was shortlisted for a Palestine Book Award. And in 2018, she was named a Ford Fellow by the United States Artists. Uh, Leila Halabi, on the end, is the author of two novels, Once in a Promised Land, which the Washington Post listed as one of the best novels of 2007, and West of the Jordan, which won a Penn Beyond Margins Award. And in 2012, she published a collection of poetry called My Name on His Tongue. She received a Fulbright scholarship to study folklore in Jordan. And I love this part of your bio, by the way. It started out as, um, as a project listening to Palestinian refugee kids recount folk tales turned into a lifelong obsession with stories and creativity as an antidote to suffering. And she's woven storytelling into her work with cancer patients, veterans, and refugee survivors of torture and trauma. And I think tonight we'll be exploring just that theme, the power of storytelling, and looking at questions of identity and representation. What does it mean um, to see yourself in the pages of a book? Who are the storytellers? Who are the gatekeepers? And how are Arab American writers dealing with the current political pressures in their lives and in their work? So we'll chat for a bit, um, listen to some of their readings, and then open it up to all your questions. Um, yalla. <laughs> <laughs> So, you guys know I'm a reporter, so I don't believe in the softball question. <laughs> We're gonna get uh, right down to it. Um, I thought that it might be helpful first to even describe what we're talking about when we say Arab American literature. And um, there's a question that I've thought about ever since I heard it posed. It was in an essay in 2008 by Palestinian American poet Lisa Sohair Majej. And she asked basically, is there even such a thing as Arab American literature is there some Arab American essence defining and binding together individual texts as part of a larger whole? So the three of you explore similar themes, but in very different ways, um, with through very different narrative devices and characters. So what are we talking about when we say Arab American literature? Easy, right, I wanna mm. say? <laughs> we really are starting out with the difficult. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, is reporter. it enough to be an Arab American yeah. who writes literature? Is there something, is there a connective tissue beyond that that links these, these works? I, I, fe I feel like there doesn't have, you know, the, the early Arab American literature that, that I read, a lot of it was starting to come out in the 90s. A lot of it um, kind of identified as Arab American because there were things related to food. There was always like a grandmother who had magical <laughs> powers. <laughs> who made amazing magical food, you know, these kinds of things. But you find that in a lot of the uh, writing, uh, early writing of um, people of color. So that's not unusual. Um, and I don't think that an author who's Arab American has to have anything that is identifiably Arab American in the work. But what I feel in, in my work that I'm trying to do is I have Arab American characters who I, I do have some sprinkling of Arabic in my book. I don't, in my books, I don't translate the words. I try to make them recognizable or understandable. But so for me, it's the Arab American characters, it's the use of the language. And also there's usually a theme of, of, of being an outsider. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that, that theme that runs through the book because that, that's been my experience. And so um, that's what I identify as Arab American mm -hmm. about my work. Yeah, what do you think? Well, and I, I find that while you know there's the connector, the connective tissue is usually genealogy. It also puts you in this uh, uh, category. You know, if you're Arab American, then you're not really American. So mm -hmm. we can put you over here, and we can it, we'll we'll read you during you know in an ethnic studies class, but not <laughs> in American literature. And I think that is changing as there's more, and and maybe that's. A sort of a sweet little silver lining of uh, technology, you know, yeah. because we have access to so much, and I think more people are curious. But I don't know. Like you said, the the connection with food, it, it in in some ways it seems, you know, disingenuous. I think mm -hmm. to to just tie us like that, mm -hmm. because we are too easy. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. yeah, it's not as nuanced. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I've seen the same. We were talking about, you know, in journalism, mm -hmm. that feeling of being pigeonholed and, you know, how, yes, I might have liked the Paris Bureau, mm -hmm. but I was sent to Baghdad, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and how on one s and, and in one sense you, um, you want to be able to do 
whatever is mm -hmm. available to everyone else. But at the same time, when the, there are stories that are sensitive and it is a community that's been stereotyped, you know, mm -hmm. for however long since Valentino and the Shaker, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, I mean, who do you trust to tell these stories too? Right. Um, and do you have a responsibility to tell that story versus right. a different story? Right, mm -hmm. yeah. And since you've moved to the States, uh, have you found, uh, have you <laughs> linked up with Arab or Arab American writers? Have you found a, a robust Arab American literary scene? Uh, at the beginning, when I first came to the States, uh, as you know, I drove a cab for mm -hmm. eight years. So I, at that time, I, it was very difficult for me to uh, to find any writer, whether American or Arab writers. I was isolated <coughs> in my cab for seven days a week, 10, 11, 12 hours a day. This was in Chicago? It was in Chicago. And in my first year, I, I couldn't write anything. Hmm. I stopped writing, I stopped reading, I became, I felt as if I became someone else. Hmm. I lost my soul as a writer. Yeah. I, f I saw in, in an interview with you, you said that that feeling of driving a cab when you'd rather be writing or doing something more creative was, uh, what did you call it, a spiritual exile in addition to the physical exile from exactly. the period that you felt. Can exactly. You, what, what is that? What is it was kind of, actually, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's a very bad feeling. Hmm. More than hardship, it was really a very bad feeling and... Uh, I got depression, depression because of that. But at the same time, I tried to be strong. I did my best to fool myself because I was looking for the future. I came to America to, to establish my name as a writer. I was looking for a new horizon. But I became a cab driver. So my, actually my cousin suggested me to drive a car because he said it's, uh, it takes a while to, to publish your book, so you have to be realistic and you have to find any job. I applied everywhere, but it was for nothing. Mm -hmm. So after a long argument with him, after two days from that argument, I was driving cab number 45, Horizon Taxi Company, uh, in a city like Chicago. In Syria, we used to say to the drivers, take a left, take a right. In Chicago, people say, Go north, go south, go east. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so when people ask me to go north, I go south. Go east, I go west. <laughs> I have thousands of funny stories. Some, some of them uh, open the door and run away. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't getting to have deep literary conversation. <laughs> Although that you did, uh, the, you, how did you power through that feeling of exile and out of being out of place um, and I to create then in that later, after that yeah these later later I tried to go back to myself as a writer I How? forced myself to go back to my writing mm. go back to my readings uh, start to talking with the customers not aggressive customers not drunk customers <laughs> for, for sure <laughs> they have stories some <laughs> some of them were very helpful they were uh, not, not only some of them, many of them were very, very nice. Um, so uh, I, can I, yeah, I can tell you, I became the worst cab driver, not only in America, in the whole world. <laughs> 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 it was also in that cab that you're tra you were working on the translation, right? How did that yes. work? <laughs> Yes, uh, actually, I want to talk uh, uh, first about my translator, C.J. Collins. I first met him in Damascus 2006. Then uh, he became my best friend. He is such a wonderful person. At that time, I told him, maybe I will, I will immigrate to America. I will move to America. He said, once you get there, just send me an email and uh, uh, we'll keep in touch. So I did that, he suggested me, he said, do you wanna translate your work into English? I said, yes, of course. So he flew from Boston to Chicago and we started translation in the front seat of my cab. <laughs> How did sometimes, that happen? Sometimes I was running away from cu my customers. I was looking, uh, <laughs> losing money sometimes, but I wanted to, to translate. It, it was a great opportunity for me. 
So these two collections um, were translated in the font sequence. So you had written those back in Syria? Yes. Okay. Most of them were uh, previously published uh, in my Arabic work. Right, right. Mm -hmm. and some of them, yeah. I wrote some of them here. Mm -hmm. um, before we get into a, a reading of them, I just I have to tell you that I read them with admiration, but also a bit of envy, because I would, you know, when I was covering Syria and Iraq and different conflicts in the region, I would be given 2,000 words to write a story and ask for another 1,000, mm -hmm. and I still couldn't, you know, I felt like it didn't even come close to grasping the reality I was seeing on the ground, and yet here you are with these three sentence mm -hmm. <laughs> short stories and, you know, um, just this incredible distillation of all these complexities uh, of the region, uh, why? How did you gravitate toward that very short, sh very short story genre? Can you talk a little bit about its yeah, history actually, in Arab, Arab Actually, literature? it was by accident. Truly, uh, I, I never tried to or chose this style. The, the, the style chose me. Since I was 13, 14, 15, I start to write. So, I just at that time I just wanted to express my feelings, to put my heart on my papers to be honest with myself. Later I was told, uh, this is a very short story. Well, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem with that? <laughs> I don't care about genre. Yeah. I, I care about honesty. Creativity, in my opinion, is honesty. Mm. To be honest with myself, to be honest with, with my uh, reader. Mm -hmm. mm. And, uh, but I can tell you, uh, it takes me a long time to finish even one sentence. Mm -hmm. Maybe so it's deceptively I'm simple. Yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, I always revise, keep revising, keep revising. I'm slow motion, but it's good mm -hmm. anyway. <laughs> In creative work, it's very good to, to be slow motion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It takes me a long time. Some people think that it's a very short mm -hmm. story, so why it, it takes you a long time? Well, then when we read them, they're, they pack that punch mm -hmm. that sometimes sneaks up on you mm -hmm. even you know, after you've heard it for a while. You'll mm -hmm. find myself thinking of, of some of the parables mm -hmm. um, in your work. Uh, and I, I want to add something. Beside uh, that, when I was driving cab, I was singing the Beatles too. <laughs> okay. To stay strong. Okay. <laughs> I feel like we have to hear some of your work now. Uh. <laughs> And as I understand, you're going to be reading some stories about sh stories and, and poetry about human rights, human dignity, um, arrogance. I think was most of my writing about human dignity, about yeah. human rights, about uh, arrogance. Mm -hmm. The pride of garbage. When the owner of the house picked up the bag of garbage and headed out to the street to throw it in the dumpster, the bag was overwhelmed with the fear that she would be put side by side with her companions. But when the man placed her on top of all the others, she became intoxicated with her greatness and looked down at them with disdain. <laughs> <laughs> the pride of the middle finger. <laughs> the middle finger couldn't resist the urgings of her own narcissism. I'm better than all of you, she said heartily to her colleagues, and I stand above you. <laughs> <laughs> and how might you be better, O oh venerable one? Asked the other fingers, eyeing her with disapproval. I'm the tallest. <laughs> She answered in a loud voice, her head held high. Shock cut the tongues of the fingers. 
but they soon exploded in laughter. Nevertheless, the middle finger continued in a voice louder than before. All of you must bow down in admiration and reverence to my greatness. <laughs> Hiding their laughter, the other fingers bowed down sarcastically. <laughs> but the middle finger was greatly surprised to see the people in the street looking at her and laughing. I'll read one from my, my second book in, in English, The Teeth of the Comb, and this one is very long. The Knife. I'm reading from, from my memory. He was born with a silver knife in his mouth, and he was its first victim. The end. <laughs> Tongue tie. Before leaving for work, I tied my tongue into a great tie. My colleagues congratulated me on my elegance. They praised me to our boss, who expressed admiration and ordered all employees to follow my example. How did he sit on his mouth? The third world politely asked the first world to get off his chest so that he could breathe a little better. The first world obligingly, obligingly got up, but then promptly sat down on his mouth and released a terrible fart. Priceless. After years of searching, I was finally led to the place where I could see freedom. She was on exhibit in a museum surrounded by barbed wire and guarded by thousands of heavily armed men. She looked sad and broken. When I asked one of the guards why she was there, he pulled me strongly by the arm and whispered in my ear, she's priceless. The last one, this one is extremely short, and I'm, I'm true this time. <laughs> Looking down, I looked down on the people from the highest wall of my lofty palace. In one voice, they shouted as loud as they could, how small you are. Thank you. <laughs> you know, in listening uh, to your reading, it just reminds me of, I mean, there's humor, there's satire, there, we're, we're laughing at parts. But then you sit with those words, and but underneath is actually often something quite devastating, a devastating truth. Um, yep. Kind of black comedy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, Arab, uh, Arabs do gallows humor really well, <laughs> I've found. Um, but, but how do, you f how do, how do Arab, Arabic speaking audiences engage with your work? And what do you hear, because you've been, of course, well known in Syria and published widely there, read widely there before coming here. Um, what do you see as, as different in the audience engagement there and there? I got the same reaction hmm. in Syria and here, both in Syria. I was told in Syria you write in very strange style. 
even my mom and my father said that. My <laughs> father was philosophy teacher and he teach me and uh, he guided me a lot to read specific books. But at the same time, he said, your, your style is very strange to me, son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got the same reaction here too. Me too. Um, and maybe later we can also get into some of the, I, you know, the choice of like personification mm -hmm. and you know, the knife is alive, various animals are, you know, having thoughts. And um, that's an old tradition in Arabic literature. Was that yes. something you were consciously doing or was it just that's how you knew stories to be Im told? Imagination is a big gift for humanity. Mm. Einstein said that. So you can see inspiration everywhere, mm -hmm. not only among humans, among objects, among animals. So I feel there's all these new creative ideas everywhere. Mm -hmm. You can make a story from a conversation, for instance, uh, conversation between two chairs, conversation between two walls, mm -hmm. conversation between two cats, two dogs, between cat and dog. There's <laughs> infinite endless, yeah, exactly. Um, and Su Susan, your, where you grew up and how you grew up was very different. And it was in South, South Philly, yeah. uh, an experience you drew on, you have drawn on in, in several of your works, um, especially uh, the one that, um, that I really remember is what Inherit, I'm gonna get, I don't wanna get the name wrong. Inherit, Inheritance of the Exile, exile yes. my first book. Mm -hmm. Right, these um, stories of young women sort of on the cusp of adulthood coming into their own, their independence, their identities, and I saw somewhere that you wrote your first story in the fourth grade mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. It was, was a terrible story. It was a terrible <laughs> story. We, and tonight, well, she'll be reading that. <laughs> and so, no, I burned it. Yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering what, you know, um, was there a role for literature in how your own Arab American identity was shaped? Did you see yourself in, in novels and poems growing up? Um, no, never. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think, um, so, so I grew up in, in an immigrant household. My parents came in 1967 from Palestine. And I never read uh, a work by an Arab American or a Palestinian American writer. You know, it was the 1970s mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. Um, there was no representation at all. My Barbie dolls really made me feel bad about myself and about really, I mean, I think, you know, <coughs> girls growing up in that time having these, these dolls and these toys and these mm -hmm. images of like perfect beauty that doesn't represent them is, is really quite devastating. And so literature, like I would read Anne of Green Gables. That was my favorite book of all, still is my favorite book. My daughter's reading it now. We're bonding over that. It's a wonderful experience. Um, but Anne, of course, is an outsider in her little town, right? She's the oddball, she's a different one. And I think maybe that's why I connected with her. I always felt very different. Um, and I'm writing a children's book now because I really don't see, even my daughter is asking how come there are no books with Arab girls in them? And I asked that question when I was her age. So it's about time, right? Yeah. So um, I'm writing a children's chapter book series starting an Arab American girl. And I'm, I'm very excited about it. And my daughter's excited. She's edited me already. <laughs> <laughs> she likes it, but she has some suggestions. How old um, is she? She's 12, so she has a lot of opinions, lot of, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, things are different for her now. You know, there are dolls that look like her. Right. There are, you know. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a new world, it's a changing world. Our world is opening up. It doesn't feel that way all the time, right? But it is nevertheless, we are making progress. And there are now more voices in publishing, right? Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so in my work, I do represent that time growing up um, as, as a daughter of, of Arab immigrants, you know, but, but the other side of this is that in my, in my house growing up, there was always a role for literature. Like my father loves poetry and he would walk around just reciting lines of Arabic poetry and he would stop me no matter where I was, right? I could be carrying a load of laundry upstairs and he'd say, Susan, Sosan, <laughs> call me Sosan, Sosan, listen to this line, I just remembered. And he would tell me this line and explain it to me. And, and we would have this conversation, you know. 
Um, and my father plays oud, he plays lots of music, uh, he sings a lot, my mother was always reading, so there was always a role for literature, for books in my house, and that was really a gift to grow up in a house of, of readers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think my love of books, you know, comes from that, that experience. Mm -hmm. when, you, um, when you decided to, to capture, you know, sort of life for these young women in, Phil in Philadelphia and in some of your other characters as well, I mean, how do you decide what goes in and what goes out and what, what to leave out? What do you, um, how conscious are you of the whole body of stereotypes and um, sort of, I don't know, just really portrayals that I never found familiar or recognizable. Some weren't necessarily bad, it was just, I've never met an Arab like that, you know, or I don't know mm -hmm. what, this doesn't ring true. Yeah. Um, what did you, how did you go about, you know, just sort of deciding what parts to share? So, so Virginia Woolf has this uh, thing she says about how for women writers, there's like this, um, this angel in the house, this, this other woman who's always looking over your shoulder and telling <laughs> you this is not proper, mm -hmm. this is not right. So I think for Arab women writers, it might be like, like an auntie looking over your shoulder right. saying, <laughs> <laughs> don't say that, that's not nice. Mm -hmm. Or don't portray us like this. And, 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 and the truth is that uh, we are really badly portrayed in the media already, mm -hmm. yeah. okay? And yet, I grew up in a family where um, I was taught you can love your culture and your your people and still be critical of mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. elements of your culture. And so I, as a fiction writer, um, even though I'm creating a world that's not factual, it's fictional, I still have to be an honest writer. So I have to write honestly mm -hmm. because actually my first duty is not to the Arab community, mm -hmm. it's not to my family, it's actually to my reader. Mm -hmm. And so I take that very seriously. Um, and I try to portray what I see as, you know, the kind of textured fabric of, of our community. So I, I, I depict things that I think are wonderful things and I, I depict things that I think are not so great, you know, that I've always struggled with some elements of our culture or certain people that I have met. So I just try to be honest with my reader because that's my, that's my duty, I feel. Yeah. Is that something you also have? Yeah, very much with? so. I, I, I think it's very difficult to, you know, you have flawed characters. That's just the nature of life. But when you're already so maligned, you know, you're hesitant to say, okay, well, this person was mm -hmm. an abuser or this person. But it's exactly what you're saying. As long as you're telling an honest story, I don't think it's, it, it's not gratuitous. You know, I think what we struggle with is there's so much gratuitous negativity. Mm -hmm. It's not, there's no, it's like it's not. They'll go out of their way to, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. just to say it, rather than, you know, you're not creating a complex human who is flawed. Mm -hmm. You're just showing the flaw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've had a couple of sort of major controversies on the literary scene around that idea of who gets to tell these stories, who gets to green light these stories, um, all the way down to the cover art, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, the one I'm thinking of first, there was the American Heart novel last year. It was um, quite an incident where uh, a woman, uh, an author, Laura Moriarty, wrote this book about a futuristic Muslim detention camp in Nevada, but it was told through the eyes of a young um, white w girl or woman who sort of shepherds them to safety, um, an older Muslim woman to safety. So Kirkus took the um, very rare step of removing a star from the review after a lot of people, after there was a lot of outcry about the white savior trope, here we go again. And then just this week, we have seen it come up again with, I wanna make sure I get the name right. Oh yeah, the graphic novel, A Suicide Bomber Sits in the Library, it was pulled from publication after a lot of criticism, including a letter signed by more than a thousand writers, teachers, and readers about the stereotypes in the storyline. It's basically a brown kid walks into a library with a bomb strapped mm -hmm. uh, to his body. And both of these sort of fall under this um, debate going on where, you know, in literature, but as beyond it, saying, you know, or one side saying, yeah, well, this is what happens when groups that have been marginalized and stereotyped uh, speak up about their portrayal. 
And the other sort of flip side to that is censorship. This is censorship, it's a slippery slope, and if we start saying you can tell the story and you can't, that's gonna, we're gonna end up in a place with less freedom to tell these stories, not more. Where do you fall on that debate? Have you, is it something that you've dealt with personally? Well, I signed that petition about the, okay. uh, the, the, the graphic novel. Um, I'm what what bothered you about tell it to me? So, so in a, here's the thing, in a perfect world, if the publishing industry were really diverse and we had a lot of stories, that it's very rare to have an Arab American published author or a Muslim American published author. It's, it's really very, very rare. The publishing scene is still pretty homogenous. It's getting better, but it's still homogenous. Um, so in a perfect world, if we had lots of voices at the table, there's no reason why someone uh, like a, a graphic novelist couldn't write that story, mm -hmm. right? Because there would be something else to balance it out. But right now, we have like this, um, you know, imbalance. And so it, th what bothered me is that that story might, may have been seen as like a dominant narrative. Mm -hmm. And it may have edged out um, opportunities for other writers to like, you know, show a different side to, or, or present a different voice. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm just tired of that whole, I'm just tired <laughs> of that, <laughs> you know? Um, for example, I just, I just read the other day that um, there's gonna be a movie made about the experience of Syrian refugees and it's being written by Lena Dunham. Yeah. Like there are no Syrian writers out there who can, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> do this. Uh, you know. So why, why are we edging out the voices of people who can tell those stories? Mm -hmm. You know, why is there that imbalance? So we still have that problem. Yeah. Also the same debates going on in journalism as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. People ask me, why do you have the Muslim beat? Why does it, can't it just be in, you know, religion beat or whatever? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, yes, in a perfect world, there wouldn't be a need for, <laughs> for this. But if you have a group that's been singled out and, mm -hmm speeches, bans, executive orders, whatever, you, mm -hmm. I think deserve scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, is this something, uh, Osama or Layla, that you've, you know, this debate, this push and pull over telling the agency mm -hmm. of telling your own story versus telling someone else that's, that they shouldn't tell that story or you don't have the, the right to tell that story? Well, I think what she's saying is really interesting, you know, about the, the <coughs> the balance of things, you know, you don't have, you don't have the other side, so it's not, you know, I've always been sort of 12 about it, like you don't get to, it's like you don't get to talk about my mother, but I can <laughs> say what I want kind of thing. But it's so much deeper than that because I think it has to do more with power. You know, if I can tell your story, I control it. If I let you tell it, who, you know, who knows how it's gonna turn out. And I think at the root of it is that, is the power. Mm -hmm issue. Osama, in, in Syria, I mean, your, some of your poems and short stories, I mean, I wouldn't even say thinly disguised critiques of the regime. They're full-on critiques. How, how did you get published there? Were there, you know, what was I, that? The I published all my books in Lebanon, not in Syria. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> it cost me a lot of money, but at the same time, uh, I wanted to avoid headache. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and that's that's uh, yeah. I forgot to tell you about something. Besides, I love this style. I wanted to avoid censorship too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I published many stories uh, in uh, local journals in uh, and magazines in, in Syria. But uh, when you write about objects, when you write about uh, animals, <laughs> they cannot catch you. <laughs> when they, sometimes they, they they would ask me, "Do you mean that?" No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's no. just a knife. Like, <laughs> what's the problem? You can avoid censorship because this tag, uh, this kind of stories take more than one interpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I publish all my mm -hmm. books in Lebanon, and it's it's very easy for you as a writer to publish your books in a, just like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about distribution? Like my publisher. Did uh, got the permission for distribution. It it took him a long time. Wow. Mm. And I was upset about that. But mm -hmm. he uh, he distributed uh, in Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt. Sure. Yeah. And what did how did you find the the 
you know, gatekeeping here when you, when it came time to translate, when you decided you wanted to translate these collections into English, did a publisher appear and say, that sounds great, we'll sign you up? I mean, how, how did that work? How did you go from driving a cab to having these two acclaimed? Actually, I first published my stories here uh, in a new magazine mm -hmm. in New York City. My agent contacted the editor there. Mm -hmm. Uh, she told her, I want to I wanna collaborate with, with Osama. I want to work with him. I like his work. Actually, two agents called call editor at the new magazine. Mm -hmm. So I was told I was lucky because I was told it's not easy mm -hmm. at all to find agent, literary agent. Mm -hmm. And in America, we don't have this system in Syria. In America, you need agent to, right. to, to, to get published. It's a very big country, and there's big competition between writers. Mm -hmm. There's thousands of writers, so uh, we need agent. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told I need agent, anyway. <laughs> okay. um, Susan, with, with uh, you have two projects coming up, right, mm -hmm. that you're working on. Can you tell a little bit, when you mentioned them earlier, can you say a little bit more, and then maybe we can hear from, uh, oh. hear the excerpt from one of them. Yes, so I have, um, I just signed um, a, a four book contract, to write a children's chapter book series. Great. It's the first chapter book series starring an Arab American character. Right. I'm so excited Yay. about that. <laughs> My daughter's very excited about oh. that. 12 year old um, me is. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually her idea. Like I told you, she said to me, why are there no mm -hmm. characters? So um, I wrote the first couple of books already and I'm working on the uh, editing the first two and uh, the first two and writing the, the third and the fourth one. When and then I'm also, out? Um, January 2020, we launched okay. the series. Mm -hmm. yay. I'm excited. Um, and then we have, I have um, an adult literary novel that I'm working on now. Uh, it's tentatively titled City of Brotherly Love. It's set in Philadelphia, of course, um, in the 1970s. And it's about um, a young man named Peter Saliba, who uh, his parents are immigrants. And it's a very tight knit, small uh, Palestinian American immigrant community. Um, but Peter has decided to marry um, a woman named Linda McMullen, who is not Palestinian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and his parents are devastated and oh, angry. Okay. And the I whole thought you were gonna say everyone welcomes her with <laughs> arms and shay. And they like try to <laughs> feed her. Okay. Um, so that's, that's my novel that I'm working on right now. And my agent has it and we're sort of going back and forth with it now. Great. Yeah. Can, can you hear a little bit? Yes, sure. So um, in this scene, um, the family lives on Winslow Street in Philadelphia, which is an invented street. Um, but Linda is planning to make her appearance to meet uh, Mr. and Mrs. Saliba, and they're they're feeling very aggrieved by the whole the whole <laughs> thing. Um, so, <clears throat> within 24 hours, the arrival of Linda McMullen at 948 Winslow Street had become one of the neighborhood's most anticipated events, even more so than the upcoming papal visit. Mrs. Haddad, she's the, Mrs. Haddad is the nosy neighbor. <coughs> Mrs. Haddad told the Handals and the Khouris, who spilled the news like manna from heaven to, the, to 10 other families. In her own home, Mrs. Saliba acted like she was starring in the spotlight of an Arab drama, a role in which she'd been reluctantly cast. Peter watched his mother prowl around the living room. They're all talking, Abdullah, she said to her husband, walking over to where Mr. Saliba was listening to the news. With a huff, she flicked off the TV. Um, she locked her eyes to Peter's and spoke slowly and deliberately. I am a hostage in this house. I cannot leave the front door. Sorry, mama, he replied, buttoning his shirt. Do I deserve this, she said. <laughs> no, mama, he answered, willing to take her verbal sting so that perhaps she'd be exhausted by the time Linda arrived. Are we um, serving anything, he asked tentatively. Coffee, his father said firmly. No cakes, maybe some cookies. <laughs> Both Mr. and Mrs. Saliba looked up at their oldest son, and he felt guilty. He thought about how, when he'd been in high school, they had prayed and prayed for him to stay young until the war was over, so he wouldn't be drafted like Mrs. Haddad's sons. He knew what they were thinking now. Why is he trying to kill us? <laughs> Doesn't he know that cookies are served only on happy occasions? <laughs> The insults did not end. 
first, he had sat them down the night before and explained that he'd been dating this Americanilla without telling them for over a year. Mm -hmm. What kind of girl goes out with a boy on dates for a year without being engaged to him, they'd ask. Don't you even think for a minute, his father said, not for a minute that I'm going to call your uncles and go to her house and ask for her hand. Actually, Peter said, shifting nervously, you, you won't have to do that because I already, you know. What, Mrs. Saliba said, her voice falling to a whisper. You did what? You had the sex with her? <laughs> Peter had looked startled and shook his head. No, he paused. Well, yes. His parents had both bolted up in shock. I mean, what I mean is that you won't have to ask for her hand because I already asked her to marry me. She's not expecting you to talk to her father or anything. Mrs. Saliba had sat again like a log that had been dropped off a cliff. The old couch covered in plastic to protect the upholstery nearly buckled underneath her. And that was when the tears had erupted. Now she told him, no, no cakes, nothing, no batlawa, nothing. <laughs> Peter swallowed his outrage. He had to get through this. He had to survive this. Nobody else in his family had married from outside of the community before. What will my mother say, Mrs. Saliba was saying now? Your teta will be heartbroken. I can't tell her about this. Peter thought about his teta, Teta Meha, who lived in Palestine in a refugee camp that had become an almost permanent village. He hadn't seen her in years, although she called at least every other week. The last time they'd visited Palestine, he and his brother had been 14, their sister Leila 16. He'd learned to milk a goat because his brother had dared him to accompany Teta Meha to the small pen attached to her house where two goats and four chickens lived. He'd been brave enough to feed the chickens, much to the delight of Teta and her neighbors. Look at the Amerikani feeding them right out of his hand like a falahi <laughs> they chucked, clucked, laughing as he, they stood over the pen, warming their hands in the bodices of their embroidered dresses. Leila had whispered to her brothers one evening, that Teta Meha kept a lot of things in that hidden pocket in her bodice. Her keys, her money, her Palestinian ID card, even her pills. Peter hadn't believed his sister, so he and his brother had spent an afternoon watching their grandmother carefully, following her from room to room in the small house as inconspicuously as possible, until in the kitchen, Johnny had seen her reach her blue-veined hand into her bodice and pull out a book of matches. They burst into laughter collectively and fled the house. You crazy Amerikani children, what's wrong with you? You want to stop my heart? She had shrieked, half laughing herself after them. The next day, having understood their game, she teased them by pulling a loaf of bread out of her bodice. <laughs> Here, eat your hummus with this, she told Peter. <laughs> An hour later, when Leila had popped out of the bathroom and asked for more toothpaste, Teta had pulled a tube out of her bodice. Here, you go, Habibti. I didn't realize we were out. As she turned and walked out of the room, they all heard her snicker. When they told their mother about it, Mrs. Saliba explained it to them in one sentence. She will always be smarter than you. <laughs> now he felt that his grandmother, who hadn't even met Linda, would be angry with him, even worse, disappointed in him for this. In Linda's mind, the Salibas were a family like that of her great-grandparents who'd arrived from Ireland and landed in the northeastern part of the city, poor and hungry and unsure of their footing. Peter knew that she felt allied to his family, all caught up in some sweet image of how they were one melting pot. Peter loved that generous nature of Linda's, and he wanted her to think well of his family, of his parents, because it reflected on him too. He didn't want her to know that Mrs. Saliba's image of a melting pot looked more like a smoking cauldron, and Mr. Saliba outright rejected her. They thought, and it hurt him to know this, that she, Linda from Ardmore, who drove her own car, a 78 Tornado, who chatted about learning to cook Palestinian food, who loved the black hair on his chest, who thought he was sexy when he spoke in Arabic. They thought this girl wasn't good enough for their son. And who was he? A 25-year-old who worked in Mr. Lerner's garage, who might be made assistant manager one day, only if Mr. Lerner's lazy son finally graduated from college and took a desk job somewhere. Peter's success depended on Mike Lerner's success. And as much as Peter didn't blame his boss for holding up his son, he hated the situation. 
Peter was as good with customer. Peter was good with customers. He was good with numbers. He could give estimates on a break job on the phone while writing out a ticket for a drop off for an oil change and not make one mistake. The customers came in asking for Peter by name, and some assumed he already was a manager. If it weren't for his dark skin, they might even assume he was Mr. Lerner's son. Linda had thought so when she'd come in with her father one day and smiled at him. He'd felt important, significant when she'd looked at him, when she hadn't hesitated in her smile, and he wanted her to look at him that way every day for the rest of his lousy life, if his parents didn't ruin it first. <laughs> he left 948 Winslow Street heading to the bakery. His fiance was going to have cake, damn it. As he passed Mr. Stavrakos's, Stavrakos's stoop, the old Greek neighbor, the old man himself was leaning out the front window, as he always did, his arms propped up on a pillow on the windowsill. Hey, young man, your girl coming today? Yes, sir, she's meeting my parents tonight, Peter said. All right, the old man said, grinning, I'm ready for the fireworks. <laughs> Um, hear, hearing that one is also, it's just so many familiar themes and all the things that I think we've said we didn't get to see um, growing up, you know, all the, but we did, there were books and um, in genres where we did find sorts of stories of emig immigration mm -hmm. and, you know, again, for all the laughter, mm -hmm. it is hard to deal with this stuff mm -hmm. and it's hard to, you know, bring a newcomer, an outsider into the circle and, mm -hmm. and to figure out who you want to be and the whole expectation versus what you want to do with mm -hmm. your life. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you and I had talked before, I think, about um, even if you didn't find that in Arab American literature, you found it in other places. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about some of those sort of influences? And Absolutely, yeah. Um, so as I said, growing up in this country, in the 70s and 80s, there were not um, Arab American writers, at least writing in English, that I, I had access to. Um, and so I actually was very deeply influenced by African American literature. Um, June Jordan, June Jordan was writing poems about Palestine. Oh, that's right. You know? yeah. um, and I, I still love her work. Um, she was a magnificent human being, <laughs> as well as a, as a poet and an activist. Um, in fact, the title of my book, A Curious Land, is actually a quote from uh, W.E.B. Du Bois in uh, The Souls of Black Folk. He says, um, it's a scene about, a line about when he, when he went to Tennessee from Massachusetts, and he, said, he, he says about the Deep South, you know, what a curious land is this. It's filled with untold stories and tragic, uh, tragic stories, untold tragic stories. And that's how I've always thought about Palestine. You know, if mm -hmm. people could just know what Palestine is really like, it's more than just a headline mm -hmm. in the New York Times or on CNN. It's so much more than that. There's so many love stories and, and dramas and, and, be and beautiful things. Um, so I, I borrowed that line from Du Bois. I quoted that line in the, in the book's um, epigraph. Um, so yeah, I was very deeply influenced by African-American writers. I think from them, I learned a way to express that feeling of being an outsider in a, in a literary way. Mm. Um, so yeah, and, and, and now I, I, I feel like I, I still read a lot of African-American writers. Edwige Dandukat is one of my favorite mm -hmm. writers. Um, Rohinton Mystery is mm -hmm. a Canadian, Indian Canadian writer. I love his work. He writes historical novels about India. So I, I still gravitate towards writers who are uh, people of color who are writing mm -hmm. about the feeling of, of being that outsider mm -hmm. in, in the Western world. And Leila, in your work, there's also a theme that I've seen of, um, of that sort of, again, expectation versus what you want to do, where do you, be of belonging, mm -hmm. of straddling worlds, of being called to be one person here and then going overseas and a whole new set of rules and, and, and cultures and expectations. And I mean, how did you, um, how did you decide to explore that in a literary way? When did, when did that happen? Did you see yourself always, you know, did you have a strong Arab American identity growing up or is that something you sort of came into? Some of your poetry suggests that it was 
you know, some of these sort of, I guess, at some point in your life you were um, made aware <laughs> that, oh, you're actually not white. <laughs> and <laughs> you have a, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think having both worlds, because I had, you know, the, the American world that I grew up in, and then my father was always absent. So I think how I identified was more with absence. Mm -hmm. So, and actually, I do remember, I had always written, and I think writing was my way of just dealing with insanity and everything. But I do remember reading Cry the Beloved Country when I was like yeah. 16 or 17. And I was like, oh, this is what you can do with your words. And that changed how I approach things. I don't think, like, my mother's family was her, they're immigrants. I mean, they're Scottish immigrants. Yeah. So it's like the other end of that. Mm -hmm. Gene pools never meant to come together. <laughs> But, you know, there was, there was a lot of reading in our house, but it was very Western reading, very white reading, very, and, and there was no, there really wasn't the understanding that I was not finding myself in, in all of these things and the, my frustration with it. And like I had mentioned, I remember going through the bookshelves and coming across a collection of poetry by Mahmoud Darwish. And it was like, I think those books kind of led me on my path. It's like I was always, it was always imposed on me. You're Arab, you're Arab, you're Arab. But there was no, there wasn't the, the big tribe with all the food and the grannies to support that. So I think I always gravitated towards, you know, the outsider. Mm -hmm. I was thinking when you were talking about the, the literature when you're younger. And I was like, well, Judy Bloom. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I can't yeah. even remember what I read when I was yeah. younger. But but for that same reason, yeah. I think, you know, you're not <coughs> finding yourself. So you find yourself in the quirky and mm -hmm. I, I came across a quote of yours um, too that uh, or no, it was actually in one of your writings where it was a line about how an immigrant family's hobbies are unnecessary and there's no time for goofing off especially when your mother's family has lost a country. Mm. And that was such a powerful and devastating line, especially when you think of that heaviness applied to a child, mm -hmm. you know, and um, as it is today for a lot of displaced kids growing up mm -hmm. in various kinds of conflict. And the case that your work seems to, to make is that there is this like, there's a healing power to it. And you've talked about that in your, um, in your social services mm -hmm. work as well. Is there something you can share from that of, of seeing that power of storytelling in action? Because I think we have also, you know, it's a hard time right now. There's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure and it's easy to focus on the doom and gloom and the people that you're working with are going through often traumatic mm -hmm. experiences. What is the, I mean, have you seen that, the, the sort of um, power of storytelling up close in, in that sense? Well, so I really want to tell a story about, you know, some wonderful <laughs> refugee story who writes and, yeah. but that's not the story I'm going to yeah. tell. I worked, um, I worked at the VA in the poly trauma unit. I taught a creative writing class for a few years there. And, okay, so there's HIPAA, so there's only so much I can say anyhow. Mm -hmm. But I had a student who couldn't write a sentence. I mean, he couldn't, he, and they all had brain injuries and then other mm -hmm. stuff. So he, he couldn't, you know, I mean, writing sentences was really difficult. So I had a classroom, also I've gotta say, this was my eye opener into the military as a great equalizer, because I had men, women of all backgrounds, all ages, it was, mm -hmm. it was really interesting. But, um, so they came at, at various levels of writing ability, communication abilities, whatever. And this particular gentleman could not write more than, you know, like a six word sentence. And we, you know, I would do all these different exercises, like having chairs talk to each other actually <laughs> is an amazing way for somebody who's struggling. It's like it, you find different pathways to communicate. So I remember like, I don't know, maybe three or four weeks into this, the first class, he was with me the full, three years, but about three or four weeks in, I would always bring a poem. And you know, sometimes they resonate, sometimes they don't. 
And I brought the poem um, by Lucille Clifton, um, my sister Josephine, which is tiny. And it's about, if I had a memory, I would recite it. I don't have that memory. <laughs> but it's about her very flawed sister. And prior to her, her, you know, her father is dying and her sister comes home. And, and, and it was like the whole class woke up. And they, they debated whether it's, you know, well, she wasn't a good person. She did these things. No, no, no. She was great. She was great. And after that, this gentleman began to write. It was like something opened up. And by the end, and I mean, I'm not saying this because this isn't, I mean, I just happen to be there. But he was writing stories. He was writing poems. He was writing love poems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was somebody who the, the speech therapist had said he's not going to, you know, he's, he's never going to get beyond this. And I think, like, my takeaway from it, not very scientific, but is that if you, you know, there is this, the, the will to live that you mentioned earlier that pushes you and pushes you and finds a way. And sometimes stories are the, the door that gets you there. Um, may I hear some of your, your poems here? You're doing poems, yeah. I'm doing poems. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I just, it's stories. So my, my. Uh, and this is from which? This is from um, My Name on His Tongue. Okay. Um, I, my, I had a poetry teacher. I, you know, I didn't really like poetry because I didn't get poetry. And I had this funky poetry teacher who was from Kentucky. And I remember him saying, poems are, are, stories for people with really short attention spans. And I'm like, OK. So there you have it. How old were you when you wrote your first poem? Like 18, 19? Yeah, I mean, stories were my thing. But I don't know. This, this, I think this taught, taught my stories to be more lyrical. Home. As a young child, when home was where you lived, and where you are from was more about your parents, I thought I belonged to the whites because that was where my house was. I pretended those children with chisels in their powdery hands and spit in their wet pink mouths didn't mean to hurt me as they questioned my name, my face, my place of birth, my father's absence. Later, when I stared in the mirror, examined my skin, peeled it back, peeked through at tissues and veins and blood, saw who I really was, I opted for the Arabs, erased all whiteness, erased my house, let those warm, dark arms hold me, love me, make me theirs, build me a new house. It worked for a while, until I found out that home is inside, not out, that the view changes depending where I sit which window I look out of. Mixed blood is like an old trailer that's always frowned at, because no matter where it's parked, it's always out of place. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can drag it anywhere if your hitch is strong enough. Just be careful. If there's a hurricane or tornado, yours will be the first to go. Um, this is after a reading by Khaled Mtawa, who's a Libyan poet who lives in the States. One, your place in the world is solid. My place in the world moves without a schedule, is based on mishaps, unwanted affairs, political discord. My place drifts between here and there, west and east, sometimes gets lodged in between. My place is a somewhere that cannot be found on any map, was detached as I was born in a place that belonged to neither of my parents. Can't be an immigrant if you haven't left somewhere. Can't be native if you're from somewhere else, which is why I'm fluent in the language of exiled souls. My place in the world got misplaced like luggage. Sometimes on clear days or smoky nights or during peace marches 
or poetry readings, I remember the fine leather, the soft but durable hide, the confidence in the brass handle. My place peeks out during certain questions. Who is your father? Are you related to the queen? Where is Palestine? Questions that can't be answered by someone with no place, no wreckage to trace, all gone before me generations. Two, my place re-relocated with the arrival in airplanes of 19 foreign nationals. My tent packed itself up in the spitting face of evangelical Christianity, vanished like Merlin, ebbed away each time George W. Bush spoke, lost its permanent residence, misplaced its green card, folded itself up origami-like, catapulted into the cosmos. I know it is somewhere, drinking coffee, drinking whiskey, watching satellite TV, writing a poem. Last night, when you told your story in that sweet voice that wrapped around English, Arabic, French, and Italian, like a member of the Ringling Brothers, my place popped out between your words, under the shadows of your accent, next to your kind laughter, coded in the forgotten protocol of Eastern greetings. It doesn't matter that you are a stranger. You're not really. You're a reflection, a visiting relative to my somewhere in between, telling your story, my story, in lines that wooed some, confused others, with words that embrace me like a grandmother, like a lover, and for 58 minutes brought me back to my own true place. And then I'm on a lighter note. <laughs> this one is not published. At a rest stop outside of Los Angeles, I have to pee. My son is grumpy because he's tired or hungry or 17. I ignore him, park the car. There are several clapboard buildings labeled men, women, man, woman. Workers in orange vests wander through with brooms. Men, women, man, woman. Why are there so many buildings? I study the signs and buildings, finally enter one labeled women, double check the tile by the door with a stick figure in a dress. An older Sikh man is standing by the sinks. He opens his mouth to say something, but I have to pee desperately enough that I ignore him and close the door to the furthest stall. When I am done, he is still standing by the sinks. I wash my hands and feel him watching me, indignant. This is the men's room, he says, <laughs> in a tone I am sure he uses with young nieces who have behaved badly. It's the women's room. I say, no, it is not, he insists. I dry my hands, smile. We walk out together. My son watches, horrified, from our car. <laughs> this is the men's room, he says. I point to the sign with the word women and the stick figure in a dress. He looks at it, then at the men's sign that I point at, shakes his head as though I am the fool in this story. See, he says. This is the men's room. I w wish him a safe trip as we part ways and continue on our journey. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, so I can't believe we've made it uh, almost, well, an hour without Trump coming up. Um, that's okay. So, yeah, that's okay, <laughs> right? Okay. That ha yeah. Maybe you guys can ask in questions because I've been told that we we have to we have just a couple um, couple minutes left before we open it up to questions. And so I thought maybe you know going back to this theme tonight of finding home, that before we open up for questions and the inevitable you know Trump <laughs> and You're having this, such a good time and yeah. Yeah, right and and and, uh, and you know just kind of what it means to work through this time. Um, but maybe first, just a quick sort of rapid fire response, no pressure, about what, it, what does home mean to you? Um, what, what is home? How do you define that? Um, my, Afsana. my home is a freedom, human dignity, human rights, equality. This is my home. 
Well, when you're Palestinian, you don't ever really have an easy answer to mm -hmm. when people say, yeah. do you have a home? Because, you know, I, w I would tell people I'm Palestinian, and, well, where is that on the map? It's not even on the map. Like, you can't even point to where it is. But um, Palestinians are really good at recreating homes wherever they go. So I think for me, home is wherever my, my children are. Mm -hmm. You know, wherever they are, that's my home. And I'll make it a home. You know, I can make it feel safe and comfortable and happy for them for us as a family. I, I forgot to mention where the Beatles are too. Though. Where the Beatles, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's on we have to have a <laughs> listening party after this. <laughs> what about you, Lynn? Um, I, for, I mean, for me, home has always been people and family, more so than place, for obvious reasons. But I think, as I mentioned to you, I, I also think home is that, that place that spot where you're a little bit uncomfortable and you're maybe pure because you're opening yourself to the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I hope you all have questions. And um, I have to take a second too to say shout out to Shahinda Helmi. Where is she? There we are. Yeah. For making this night possible. Thank you. So the, how are we doing questions? Okay, so we have mics there. Slow down, not everybody at once. <laughs> um, yeah, so here we have a question. Thank you. It's more of just a, a, a word of gratitude. Um, ha being married to a man of Lebanese immigrant parents for 30 years, as the American, I'm definitely, um, what was her name again? Linda McMullen. <laughs> I am Linda McMullen. Yeah. So <laughs> I appreciated you incorporating that part of the Arab American experience because it is a significant one for those of us who joined the beautiful um, mm -hmm. Arab American family. So thank you for the <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> And I promise you, Linda's a magnificent character. Oh. You're gonna <laughs> love her. <laughs> Do you have anyone else? Well, fine, I'll ask the Trump question. <laughs> so it's, I mean, there's obviously a lot of pressure and, you know, I feel like my, eight-year-old son can't turn on a TV or look at the internet without something that sort of questions his worth mm -hmm. <laughs> as a human being. Um, and, you know, obviously these are forces from beyond the White House, but certainly um, a lot of rhetoric and racism and bigotry has come from, uh, from this administration. And I, I feel grateful that I even work at a place where we can say that openly mm -hmm. because there has been this tension with journalists about what do we even, how do we describe this, this era? Um, so what has it been like to, to work through that? I mean, do, are you, do you keep those, try to keep those forces at bay as much as possible or incorporate them into your, into your work? Or is it inevitable that some of it sort of creeps in? I think it's inevitable that some creeps in. I find like I can, when I see how kids of color are navigating it, kind of like you mentioned your eight-year-old son, when I see my kids or the refugee kids I work with, and you realize how much pressure that puts on them mm -hmm. every single day, the fear that you know somebody might do something to them in their school or wherever, I think that's kind of, it's changed the, pl I feel like it's changed the playing field in a way um, we haven't really seen here in decades. It's not like it's totally new, but certainly new for our lifetimes. In, in your work, have you responded in any way? I mean, what? Mm, kind of. Sure. Maybe not overtly. Yeah. Not quite as subversive as the butcher right. talking the middle fingers. Too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, well, when you hear a, a president um, who vilifies media, storytellers, journalists, um, immigrants, <laughs> who you know sees a plot behind behind every criticism. Uh, You've seen where that leads uh, in some cases, you, in, in Syria at least, um, an extreme case of um, 
of those autocratic tendencies gone, gone amok. I mean, are you worried by what you see here? Is it so such a totally different context that it's apples and oranges? Or is there cause for concern from someone who's seen these forces before play out? Before Trump, I was not worried at all. Hmm. After Trump, yes, I'm worried. Mm -hmm. I never imagined this, uh, this kind of treatment for immigrants will happen in America one day. I never imagined this will happen. Beside many things, but still, I feel freedom despite that. Mm -hmm. There's no comparison between America or the Western world and the Middle East. Look what happened in Syria for one person, mm -hmm. for Bashar al-Assad. They destroyed the whole country for one person. So there's no comparison between America and there's still freedom, there's still tolerance. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it take, what's the role of the artist here in America to keep those the, those impulses at bay or to protect those rights that you say that you still are enjoying here in my, my role as a writer, our role as a writer, as artist is to keep, to make more awareness about democracy, mm -hmm. about human rights. We need to keep talking about that, keep writing about that. This is our role, about human dignity. Uh, about love, I feel there's, this is the problem not only in the States, not only in America. It looks the whole world is going to hell now. This is my, this is my feeling, unfortunately. I used to be uh, optimistic, but now I'm pessimistic. Hmm. There's much more hatred in the world than before. I don't know why as if we went back to Middle Ages, to Dark Ages, everywhere. Hmm. Have, have, is, is your take as, as bleak or as? <laughs> it's more bleak, no. Yeah. I, so I think I've been personally hurt by the number, like after the election, the number of people that I personally know mm -hmm. who ended up being Trump supporters. Um, you know, Chris Rock has this joke about how there's a new app you can download to know who, which of your friends is racist, and it's called Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and God, is that true? Because that November, right, like I was looking at these posts by people that I know that I have coffee with, that my kids play with their kids. And I, and I, I, I was like, I have to say something to them. So I said, you know, Hey, you know, I saw your post. Okay, I saw your <laughs> post. I'm like, hey, I saw your post, and I have some thoughts about that because. Oh, wow. And 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 I, I said to a few of them, I said, you know, when you when you say that this is the right way to go and we're making America great again, I feel like that's an attack on me, mm -hmm. and my family and like what I represent. Um, so it led to some really, uh, uh, well, I lost some friendships, but that was okay. You can always purge. Uh, so, um, and, and maybe, and that's okay. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's okay for people mm -hmm. to know that that their political views hurt you. Mm -hmm. So, so that's how I felt about that. But it also made me think as well that I don't think this hatred is new. I think it's mm -hmm. always been there, right? It's just been quiet for a long mm -hmm. time, and we've all been we've all been happy. We've been living the dream that things are great and things are getting better, but there's still that anger there. I think a lot of it is tied to class issues and I think we need to address that. Um, of course, what he's doing is blaming all those uh, real issues of class um, and, and wealth disparity. He's blaming them on immigrants and things like that. So I think as a, as, as a writer, maybe my job is to just keep my voice at the table, you know, to keep writing, keep representing, keep linking. I mean, I write a lot about not just Arab American immigrants, but linking that experience to other immigrants and other, other communities, to white communities as well. So maybe that's my role, you know, is to just keep reminding everyone, to my readers, that we really are um, sitting at the same table. Langston Hughes said, you know, we're the kitchen table, and we're sitting at this table together, and we have to learn to see the beauty in each other. So, can I say Please. one more thing? So I don't. I after Trump was elected, I thought, you know, I'm not an activist, but I have writing, so there's something I have to do. So I told myself, I'm going to write a story a month, and I'll 
like pinpoint it where we are. So the first story is the day of the election. I mean, the, the, the politics of it are in the background and it, they're all stories about women who have suffered some kind of trauma. Some they're from various places, but, um, and so there's 12 stories and, you know, but what I found really interesting. And you're a number. I'm, oh, you're this, I finished them. Story. So, okay. but I, I found, thought you were going to tell us how it ends. <laughs> no, but there, what I found really interesting is when I look at the first one, there was still this like optimism, you know, we can get through this. And the last one, and again, these are not about politics, they're not about our situation, they're just people living their lives with that in the backdrop. And by the last one, which is called The Disappearance, yeah. it's just, it, it, it's sort of actually, for me, it's kind of helpful to see this is where we've come in 12 mm -hmm. months. Yeah. So that, that's my little pinpoint effort. At yeah. doing um, we something. have time for just a couple more questions. So I'm um, the other half of the... Uh-oh, uh <laughs> we've started it. <laughs> uh, no, my question is to all three of you authors. How has language, uh, language played a role in your sense of exile? For example, I grew up in a Lebanese-American home. My parents spoke Arabic, but I responded in English. I understand Arabic, but when I speak Arabic in Lebanon, people think I'm making fun of the foreigner, the mukhtarab, you know, the <laughs> trying to come back and speak, uh, but then they realize, oh, he really can't speak Arabic very well. Let's dumb it down. How has language played a role in a sense of exile and being with family and the Arabic perhaps not understanding all the nuances and Osama, perhaps the, the English, you seem to speak English incredibly well, but I, the command of it and how does that play into your new writings? I can tell you people make fun of my English here too. So <laughs> sometimes, especially at the beginning, uh, I'm, I'm still, my thinking still in, in Arabic. Mm. And I'm still, to be honest with you, I'm still writing in Arabic. I'm trying to write in English, but uh, it's still not easy for me. And I, at the beginning, I thought English language is very easy language. I was completely wrong. It's mm -hmm. I think it's more difficult than Arabic language. Mm -hmm. So I'm practicing every day, and uh, so help me God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything else on language? Or I was just going to tell you a, a funny story. You might find it funny. So when my son was six, I my friends are Bulgarian, and they take their kids to Bulgarian school, and our other friends are Chinese, and they take their kids to Chinese school. So I was looking for an Arabic school, and I said to my six, he was six at the time, I said to my six-year-old son, you know, I'm gonna, mama's gonna find an Arabic school so you can go on Saturday and learn, learn Arabic. And he goes, why are we learning Arabic? We're Indian, aren't we? <laughs> 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 and I said, I said, what? <laughs> and, and he goes, yeah, aren't we Indian? I said, no. <laughs> And I said, clearly, I'm not doing a very good job of, you know, translating our culture. So I thought to myself, okay. And it really made me stop and think that I just have, I think when you're raising a family, you know, in this country, you just have to, like, be more clear <laughs> and maybe just work harder. Like, those things that came across naturally, like, from your parents to you, I'm, I'm, I was born here, so I have to just work harder to, like, transmit those values, those mm -hmm. cultural things, and, and, you know, so I have to make what at Diwali as well as mac and cheese, you know, like, those kinds Very of things good. to go back to food references, but it's just, it's just <laughs> more work, so it's more, like, conscious, a conscious mm -hmm. effort to make the language part of your everyday life, just like you make the values and the traditions mm -hmm. part of your everyday life. Great. I think we're actually out of time, but I would love to remind you that we will have books available for purchase and signing, and you can ask all the rest of your questions to these wonderful guests um, in just a few minutes. In the main lobby, I think it is, right? Yes, yeah, set up out there. I just want to say thanks again to all of you for coming and to Penn Faulkner Foundation for doing this, and of course, to the three of you. And thanks thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.